Sister Jenny, Jenny from Portishfield. Before I ask for prayers for her. She just drove up from Georgia Monday, so I'm glad she got here. Yeah. <laughs> isn't much fun, is it? No. Anybody else? Everybody will get one tonight. Uh, it is different than what's in your book. Uh, the guy that wrote that lesson in your book, he did a great job and uh, know him quite well. All my life I've known him. Uh, but I found some other material that we're going to share tonight on Uzziah in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. So as you're waiting on Rand Ferry, open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. It wasn't Russell, it was me. I said it was somebody that I had known all my life. Me. I wrote the material. But I found some better stuff. <laughs> that I like. Yeah. How you doing, Joe? Feel good? Yeah. How are you? All right. Second Chronicles 26. Would you choose success, mediocrity, or failure? What would you choose? Success. I success. Mike, you would choose success. Anybody else? That's what it's doing. Okay. 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 Depends on the cost. Huh? We know through history a lot of people, athletes, movie stars, famous people that have had success but then ended up failing. And we know some people through history that failed but ended up with success. And we know some people that have been in the middle and have gone either way as well. Well, tonight we're going to look at Uzziah and somebody that got tripped up by his own success. Emily Dickerson wrote, success is counted sweetest by those who have never succeeded. And the Scottish author Carlyle wrote, affliction is bad for every person that can handle prosperity, but there are a hundred who can handle adversity. As we mentioned last week with Amaziah, there was some people also mentioned in the Old Testament with that name. And tonight with Uzziah, there is a total of five other, four other people with that name in the Old Testament. So I want to make sure that we know who we're talking about tonight. One of those men named Uzziah was the son of Urel of the tribe of Levi in 1 Chronicles chapter 6. But that's not the guy we're going to look at. Another was the father of Jonathan, who supervised the storehouse of King David in 1 Chronicles chapter 17. But again, not the Uzziah we're going to look at. One was also known as Amathud in 1 Chronicles 9 or Nehemiah chapter 11. He went by Amathud. Or Uzziah. And then there was Uzziah the son of Aram, the priest who divorced his non-Jewish wife in Ezra chapter 10. Again, not the Uzziah we're going to look at. But the Uzziah we're looking at tonight was the ninth king of the nation of Judah after they, the divided kingdom. He could have been remembered as one of Israel's greatest kings, but he had a problem. And the problem was him. Tonight we're going to notice several things about Uzziah. First of all, 
Bob, but we're going to notice his roots. His roots. I need a reader from uh, chapter 26, verses 1, 2, 3. Who wants to open up tonight reading? Verses 1 through 3. Jack first. Thank you. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, meaning he came in place of his father, Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elah and restored to Ju Judah after Amaziah rested with his father. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jechaliah. She was from Jerusalem. All right, thank you. The cliff note version here is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 15, but that's just a few verses. So the lengthy part of his life story is here in 2 Chronicles. Now, what are some things that, from verses 1 through 3, that we learn about Uzziah? What were some of the things that you heard and read? He was young. He was young. 16 years old when he became king. Okay? He replaced him before his father. All right, he took over his father. What happened to his father? Died. Died? All right. All right, what else do we see there? He reigned for a total of 52 years. <laughs> Two other things were told about in verses 1 through 3. I'm not sure what it, what's significant about it, but he rebuilt a, it sounds like he rebuilt a city maybe that had been destroyed. Okay, he rebuilt the city of Elah, and we're going to look at that and see here in a little bit why that was mentioned there. And then last of all, we see about him what? Huh? His mother's name is mentioned there, Jacqueline. All right. And so his father had been murdered. The, the people have confidence in this 16-year-old to make him king. Now, Elah was a port city at the southern tip of Israel, and it was also an important city because it sat on water. And retaking or rebuilding Elah would have been very strategic for the nation to rise to power again because it would provide safety from the enemy that was trying to attack from the water. It was an important city as it had already had a naval base built there at one time. It was also a copper smelting center for that day. So people worked in Elah. It says that he reigned for 52 years. If you did some digging, you'll find out that's the second longest king of Judah. Anybody want to guess who the first longest reigning king was? David. Not David. Somebody will look at it two weeks from now. Manasseh who reigned for 55 years, okay? And so, like Uzziah, his grandfather and his father all start off doing good, and then something happens. And so we see his roots. Well, then we're going to see his reward next. His reward. Right. I need a reader for verses 4 through 8. Who would like to read? 4 through 8. All right, Russell, thank you. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father and Amaziah had done. He sought God during the, the days of Zechariah and instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. He went to war against the Philistines and broke down the walls of Gath, Geba, and Ashrod. He then rebuilt towns near Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabs who lived in Ger. Bell against the Meunites. The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he had become very powerful. All right, where did he, where did the reward come from? Where did his reward come from here? From the Lord. From the Lord. From above. From God. Why? Because he sought after, sought after God. He put God first, and when you put God first, God does what? He rewards you. He blesses you. 
He was given great success. What kind of success did he have here? With the Philistines. He went to war against the Philistines and what? He won. He won. Okay. All right. He, he, he broke down many of the walls of their cities. He conquered cities to the south. Those from the east paid him tribute, tax money. Now, it tells us who exactly instructed Uzziah. Who was it that instructed him here? Zechariah. And who is this Zechariah? Prophet. Not the guy that wrote the book, Zechariah, but just a guy here mentioned by the name of Zechariah. And probably most historians believe different from the Zechariah we looked at last week even. All right. Um, he instructed him. Or, or some word, some versions use the word fear. Or some use the word vision for Zechariah, which means that he knew the word of the Lord, and because of that, he was able to instruct Uzziah in the word, or really, the law of Moses is what the word would have been. All right? Now, what did all of these rewards that he got lead to? His downfall. His downfall? Why? Big head. All right, why? What do we see at the end of verse 8? He became very powerful. famous or powerful. Became powerful, and that's going to help start the dominoes. Okay? And so we, we have the roots, we have the reward. Any questions so far from verses 1 through 8 or comments on verses 1 through 8? Maybe you saw what we were reading and we didn't get to it. I just want to make sure you got a chance to ask a question from verses 1 through 8 about his roots or the reward. All right, seeing none, we'll move on. Then we come to his resume. His resume. 9 through 15. Joe, you want to read that? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate. He also built towers in the wilderness and dug many cisterns because he had much livestock in the foothills and in the plain. He had people working his fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands for he loved the soil. Uzziah had a well-trained army ready to go out by division according to the numbers as mustered by Jeel, the secretary of Messiah, the officer under the direction of Hananiah, one of the royal officials. The total number of family leaders over the fighting men was 2,600. Under their command was an army of 307,500 men trained for war, a powerful force to support the king against his enemy. Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows, and slingshots for the entire army. In Jerusalem, he made devices invented for use on the towers and on the corner defenses so that soldiers could shoot arrows and hurl large stones from the walls as things spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. All right, thank you, Joe. What kind of things were on his resume here? What were some of the things on his resume? He built towers around the gates of Jerusalem. All right, he built towers surrounding the gates in Jerusalem and, and maybe lookout towers. All right. That's on his resume. What else? In the, in the desert or in the wilderness. Why do you think he did that? Okay, so maybe they could, so somebody could, some soldiers could watch the animals. Or maybe then send a report if the enemy was coming as well. To give them some heads up. So he built towers in Jerusalem, built towers in the wilderness. What else is on his resume? Dug cisterns. Dug cisterns. What do you think the cisterns provided? Water. Water. Okay. What else? Okay. He had uh, 
He had uh, worked. Uh, he had people working in the fields and the vineyards. Uh, he himself, it says, loved the soil. He loved being out in nature. What else was on his uh, resume? He had a well-trained army. A well-trained army with many men. Okay, that's on his resume. Yeah, he, he provided great supplies for, for his army, uh, shields, bows, uh, invented things so they could shoot from the top, maybe like catapults that they could throw these rocks at. I mean, man, great resume. How would you describe his leadership skills? Good. Good. He had a vision, right? I mean, not only was he status quo with the weapons, but man, he made sure they had the best and let's invent some things to make the army even better. Now, what does it say about him having people working in the fields and the vineyards? What's that say about him? His what? A farmer at heart. All right, a farmer at heart. What else does that say about him? All right, he employed people. He made sure people had work. And people liked him. People liked him. And if they're working, they're also um. growing their own food so they can be self-sufficient and not have to go out and buy food from anybody else. I mean, that's why he's got him working. He doesn't have him working like Pharaoh the taskmaster. All right, they're just working the vineyards, the fields, growing things. I mean, this is, things are going well. They're at peace. There is no war. The enemy's not after them. He's gone out and defeated the enemies. Nobody's retaliated. No other king besides Solomon had done so much either for Israel or Judah until Uzziah. He's got a great resume, but we're going to notice his reversal. His reversal. Verse 15 at the end says, His fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. The story here hinges on one word. Until. Until. That's where the story changes. Until. Until means that something's going to happen or change. Like when you're watching a movie and all of a sudden the music starts. Or a television show. And they're talking and then all of a sudden in the background music starts playing. You know, it gets louder and louder. Something's about to happen. It's as if he's going in one direction, and then something's going to happen, and his life's going to go in a totally different direction. For us as Christians, what does the word until mean for us? What does the word until mean for a Christian? Until Jesus comes. Till Jesus comes. Or I was living one way until what? Until I decided to give my life to Christ in baptism. And then I started going a different direction. All right? Until. All right? Now, Uzziah's until wasn't good at all. He followed God, and things were looking good until something happened. Something changed. He turned in another direction. He chose to remove himself from God's protection and God's power. Life would never be the same for Uzziah. Never the same. In fact, his life is going to start to take a nosedive here. And then we see his revenge. His revenge. Verse 16, but after Uzziah became powerful, 
His pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. One of the definitions of the word revenge is an opportunity for getting satisfaction. And I believe that's what Uzziah is doing here. Satisfying himself. What got in his way? Pride. Pride. Right. And I like that I found this one with the big eye. All right, Jack. He turned out much like Saul did. We're going to see here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's true. Yep. Yeah. His own pride got him got in his way and became so prideful that it says here two things took place. What's one of them in this verse? All right, that's number two. Let's let's let's. He's unfaithful to God, and then Jack, he what? He entered the temple. He he entered the temple to burn incense on the altar. Wow! Because of his pride. Now. Three reasons for Uzziah's downfall or fall. All right. Three things. All right. Number one, he focused on the external rather than the eternal. All right. How do you see that so far in the story? That he focused on the external rather than the eternal. How do we see that in his story? Just in 16 verses. But everything he did. He spent time with the troops, leading the attacks, surveying the countryside, looking at the, after the projects, checking on the fields and the vineyards, and he probably did it day and night, and in his busyness, he forgot God. And I told us a long time ago when we started this, uh, a month and a half ago, that really our study hinges on the verses of Deuteronomy chapter 17. When God says, you want a king? Okay, here's the rules that the king has to follow. And we talked about that, how Saul broke those rules, David broke those rules, Solomon broke those rules with having many wives. And one of them was, if you remember, they had to write down the law by hand and read it day and night. And he forgets. Because he was more concerned on the external than the eternal. He lost his priority. His character did not keep pace with his accomplishments. His character doesn't keep pace with his accomplishments. He had the fame, he had the fortune, but his walk didn't match his talk. It's your character that makes you, not your checkbook, not your accomplishments, your character. But it's something that you can't mandate. It's something you mold, your character. It's who you are when nobody else is watching. And then third of all, he was tripped up by his own success. Again, what tripped him up? Right. His own pride. Some versions of verse 16 read this. When he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. Well, I want us to go on and I want us to look at verses 17 and 18. Keith, you got those two verses yeah. for us, please? As the rise of priests with eighty other priests, priests and more followed him down. They confronted King Isaiah and said, It is not right for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests and descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. What does Azariah and the others here try to do? Stop. They try to stop him. 
They speak to him, you can't do this. Now what's wrong with what Uzziah did by going into the temple and burning incense? You don't think Uzziah would rationalize, I know the law of Moses, but let's not be legalistic with what I'm doing here and leading the people politically because they also need a strong religious leader. Not being able to offer incense in the temple weakens my ability to lead the people and damages my public image. Besides, if I burn the incense, it can only help to enhance our worship to God. And by the way, all the foreign kings do it. I wonder if that rang in his mind or in his head. And it's not only Azariah and these guys telling him, this came also from God. All right? Hold your finger here, and let's go to Numbers chapter 3. I want us to look at three passages real quickly in the book of Numbers that share this. There, there's others that we can look at. You see, the problem is, God forbid it. Only the priest could do this. And that's what Azariah is trying, telling him here. So the first one is Numbers chapter 3, verse 10. Who's got that? Numbers 3, verse 10. Nate. So you shall appoint Aaron and his son, and he shall attend to the priesthood. But the outsider who comes near should be put to death. Oh, Aaron and, and his son should do it, but the outsider should be what? Put to death. All right, jump over to chapter 16. Chapter 16 of Numbers, verses 39 and 40. Chapter 16, 39 through 40. Who's got that for us? Russell. So Eliezer, the priest, collected the bronze scissors, brought, brought by those who had been burned up and had been hammered out of overlay, over, overlay the altar. The Lord write to him through Moses. This was to remind the Israelites no one except a descendant of Aaron should come to burn incense before the Lord, or he would become like Korah and his followers. No one except a descendant of Aaron should come to burn the incense. Again, Deuteronomy. Write down the law of Moses and read it every single day. Guess what the, the book of Numbers is part of? The law of Moses. All right, then chapter 18. One through seven. Basically, just a real quick synopsis of what we've just been reading at, uh, anyways. Um, that they're not supposed to do this. Um, the Lord said to... The Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your family are to bear the responsibility of the offenses connected with the sanctuary. You and your sons alone are to bear the responsibility for offenses connected with the priesthood. Bring your fellow Levites from the ancestral tribes to join you and to assist you when you and your sons minister before the tent of the covenant law. They are to be responsible to you and you are to perform the duties of the tent, but you must not go near the furnishings or the sanctuary or the altar, otherwise both they and you will die. They are to join you, and you are responsible for the care of the tent of meeting, all the works of the tent, and no one else may come near where you are. You are responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the altar, so that my wrath may not fall on the Israelites again. I myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you, dedicated to the Lord to do the work of the tent of the meeting, but only you and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar or inside the curtain. I am giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary should be put to death. And so in Numbers 3 and Numbers 16 and Numbers 18, and we can keep going on, who is not listed as somebody that can go 
Uzziah is not listed because he wasn't a son of Aaron. Back to 2 Chronicles. But I just didn't want us to say, oh, well, see, Uzziah and, 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 and these guys stood up and said, no, you can't do that. They were saying, no, you can't do that because that's what God says. You can't do that. And maybe he forgot these words of Solomon. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride is a subtle thing. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, has a chapter entitled, The Greatest Sin in All the World. And after talking all about pride, he concludes with these words, quote, If you have read this, and you're convinced that this does not apply to you, then it certainly does apply to you, end quote. I like that. <laughs> Uzziah's success handled him, and it ruined him. His own success. He became so powerful. If this was a cartoon, we would see his head just getting bigger and bigger, Bigger. He was so powerful until, and everything hinged on that word. What's the fallout of Uzziah's pride? Well, as we continue reading in the text tonight, we're going to notice some terrible consequences to his prideful life. First of all, he got leprosy. He got leprosy. I need a reader for verses 19 and 20 we, as we finish up our text here. 19 and Jack, thank you. Uzziah had a censer in his hands ready to burn incense. He became angry while he was raging at the priest in their presence before the incense altar. In the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Then Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him. They saw that he had leprosy on his forehead, so they hurried him out. Indeed, himself, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. All right, I see four things here that we learn about Uzziah. Four things in these two verses. One is what? Temper. He's angry. He's got a temper. He's upset. He's got this censer in his, in his hand, and he becomes angry, and I believe Joe hit it on the head, right? He's told you, this is something you can't do. You're not the right person for it. He's angry. Number two, he starts what? Berating the priest. Berating or raging at the priest. Who dare? How dare you tell me not to do this? I'm the king. Number three, he got leprosy on his forehead. And the last thing that we learn about him is. They hurried him out of the temple. Why? Unclean. unclean. Leprosy made you unclean. I think, I think one thing that's interesting, because you see this sometimes with the folks when they get to this point, is there's no reference to him ever trying to repent. Because a lot of times with, with the kings and other folks, it's like the penny repented and God showed favor on him and, and restored him. He just, he just, he was upset. He was angry, and he, he, he went to his separate house and died. <laughs> do, do, do we think that? I mean, if he, had, if he was truly repentant, that God would have healed him and made him whole. So. If, he, if he would truly ask God, if he was free, I think so. But Joe's right; he doesn't. We don't see that. He is so prideful that he's going to stand his ground, even though he gets leprosy. Which meant he was unclean. All right. Then, boy, here's a word that we've known in the last year. He's quarantined. <laughs> He's quarantined. In, in, in uh, verse 21, Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died, and he lived in a separate house. For the rest of his life, he's going to live by himself in this separate house. And uh, that term separate house meant that really he was 
relieved of his responsibilities as the king. He no longer had the power to act as the king. One of the things that we can notice here, too, uh, this is the same as we hear uh, the apostles cleansing somebody and they become healed and, you know, leprosy left. In this case, it was completely opposite of that and it happened almost like instantaneously right after Nanger did, after his temper came and he got it. So it, God has the power to give you a life. Yeah. Which meant he, I mean, it happens in the temple. Doesn't wait for him to leave like he, he might not ever walk out. So God said, okay, I'm going to take care of you right here. Jack? We don't know how long he had to live with that leprosy. Yeah. But here's the thing. I would think that toward the, the end of his tenure, and <clears throat> just the fact that he'd been king for so many years, he just really thought he had a thing. Somebody that's been used to being involved in so much of the kingdom, Checking on the troops, building projects, hands in the dirt, working, growing vegetables, is all alone in the last part of his life. He's quarantined. Lives separate. Yeah, Russell. Oh, go ahead and read the next section. All right. He was cut off from the temple. We see here. He's cut off from the temple. He, he lived in a separate house, in a separate house, leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. What was the temple of the Lord? What was that? What was the temple? The worship of place. Yeah, worship. Where the city met, really, too. God was in the temple. It was the spiritual resting place of God. All right. Go ahead, Russell. Keep on reading. Okay. He was not buried with the kings. Verse 23, Uzziah rested with his ancestors and was buried near them in the cemetery that belonged to the kings. For the people said he had leprosy, and Jotham, his son, succeeded him as king. The question is, did he continue to serve as king? said earlier that his son was over the palace and over the Israel. I think he can be as king. Okay. And I think he could have been had leprosy for a long, long time and still be king. Okay. Um, but I don't think he, he did any ruling. Mm -hmm. But he was the king. Because he can't be out in public. And it, it says the son doesn't succeed until he dies. Until he dies. Yeah. And so... Maybe his son might have been acting, but maybe not. We don't know. I mean, you know. And you got to think about who's going to listen to the king that's got leprosy? <laughs> By God! Well, I think it's the son staying home. Yeah. But he's still considered the king. Yeah. And he dies. Yeah. And so he's not buried with the kings. Why? Why wasn't he buried with the kings? Because he had leprosy. Because he had leprosy. And this is the same Uzziah that we read about in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the king high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphs, each with six wings, and with two wings they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet, and two they were flying, and they called out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his so Isaiah says, hey, I was there the year that King Uzziah died. Um, sad. Starts off really good, doesn't he? For, for that section of, of his life, however long, I mean, great things, prosperity, peace. They got it all. But his pride tripped him up. Well, what are some lessons for us? First of all, don't judge others. Don't judge others. Do we judge other people? Oh, we might not call it that, but, you know, when you first meet somebody, you, you walk away with the, 
first impression, and maybe as you get to know them, they're nothing like your first impression because you just met them for a couple minutes and it may be something they said or maybe a look they had, or, you know, it's just like, ooh, that person just rubs me wrong and then you get to know them and man, now we're best friends. God tells us in 1 Samuel 16, 7, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. While we focus on outside appearances, God looks at the character. Again, that's molded when no one else is looking. Even though he started off strong and his pride took over his life, would we think his life was, how would we rate his life? If, if, if this was a classroom A, B, C, D, F, you know, grade-wise, what, what are we going to give you, Zion? Yeah. An F? Okay. And, and we think that's the end of his story? <laughs> now I say that to set this up. I, I would probably say that too, except that's really not the end of his time in God's Word. By the grace of God, he's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, along with some of these other kings that we've looked at the last few weeks. And a harlot named Rahab is in the genealogy of Jesus. Asa became the father of Jehoshaphat, who became the father of Jerotham, who became the father of Uzziah, who became the father of Jotham. I don't know how or why, only by the grace of God is he mentioned. You know, everyone in the genealogy of Jesus was a sinner. There's hope for us. Russell. Well, I know he didn't repent. We, we don't know that he yeah. did or didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and why I didn't record that. His son, who becomes king and reigns for 16 years, is a good king. So it says something about the influence the father had on the son, even after he died. Yep. So while he didn't, wasn't forgiven, or why he was stuck with it, yep. he was different than Mary, and Mary was forgiven and he was taken away from it. Yep. This was not taken away from him. No, not at all. It is interesting, it's very vague. It doesn't say he did evil, it doesn't say he did good. It just says he was kind of banished. Yep. So, Lived his rest of a life at his if house he, and died. If he was still acting as king and he was angry, he could have used it as an opportunity to just do horrible things from afar. It's very vague. <laughs> but Matthew, in, in writing to the people that he wrote to, mentions them. Luke does not. Luke mentions totally different people in the genealogy because of who he was writing to. But Matthew does. So don't judge people. And don't give up living for God. Don't give up living for God. All right? I, I think we saw that tonight, didn't we? He, he stopped. He, he got that big head and forgot God. Paul says in Romans 12, 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Uzziah started off with fervor. He started out great, but pride got in his way. Pride knocked him down. Himself. Pride is the scheme of the devil. He wants to make your head bigger and bigger and bigger and tell you it's all about you. It's all about me. But it's really all about God. Uzziah. Next week, Russell will lead us through Hezekiah. So, I think we'll be back in the book Yep. 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 Yeah, I mean, everybody got the word. 
a mistake except Jesus, but I mean, yeah. we all stand and fall short of the glory of God. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, help us, Father. It's not about us. It's all about you. Help us if we battle with pride to not get down. Help us to learn the lessons from Uzziah. Thank you for the study of the Game of Thrones. Bless those that were mentioned that are sick and struggling with their health and those who are going through some tough situations in their life. And Father, may we all rest in your care, your grace, and your mercy. Bless us as we go home safely. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Have a great week. See you Sunday morning.